Um, so uh, I guess today I'm going to be teaching about the, the keys to a successful design process. I, um, I'm going to move pretty quickly. So I, I teach, um, I guess uh, maybe people here know me from, from the book, and uh, I have to get a t-shirt made with that because I think it's so great. Michael greeted me at the airport the other day with like, he like hey, there's my book standing in the airport. It's like, oh, there's somebody behind it. Yeah, that's <laughs> my kind of. Um, so I, I teach design at um, the University of San Francisco. We have an undergraduate design program. And uh, of course, I focus. Uh, we have sort of traditional graphic design, typography, publication design. But I also, um, my classes are sort of more code, tend to be more code driven, interaction design, and data visualization. And I don't know how many of you in the room kind of identify as designers, but we designers love talking about process. We like processing things. Um, because in case you didn't realize, design is a process and not a product. And I think this is often a point of confusion because um, we, we call it design. We don't call it designing. We don't talk about that so much. Now, if we were engineers, it would be really obvious to say engineering is a process, not a product. Um, but engineers don't engineer engineers, which would be weird, yet designers design designs. So I think the language we use around this process is, is a little confusing because in popular culture, a design can be like a thing, a physical thing that you can point to. And you can say, wow, look at this design. Isn't it so beautiful? Or like, look at this design. Doesn't it just really capture something? You can just really get something from that design. But anybody who says design is a product is a liar because design is a process. Um, so it's not something you can see to or point to. Uh, design is not something you can, for our purposes today, is not something you can pull out of your pocket and sort of hold it up to the light and get a better look at. Um, everything in this room, of course, was designed, just about everything in this room. Um, and yet none of these things are, um, none of these things, these chairs, the walls, the lights, none of these things are designs. These are all really products that are the result of a design process, just this uh, problem-solving process. Now, different types of design, probably you come from different, you know, we have different sort of areas, subspecialties of design, and they each produce different kinds of products. So industrial design is known for objects. Graphic design is known for visuals. Uh, interior design and architecture, of course, produce, produce spaces. But none of these things, again, the, in sort of the popular understanding of design, we have this uh, incessant focus on the products themselves, the new iPhone or the latest you know, car, whatever it is, um, or the building that we're in right now. I've been really enjoying the, the architecture on the campus here. It's quite amazing. But the goal of the architecture, the goal of the iPhone, the goal of like whatever design is actually not the product itself. It's some other sort of meta goal. So either you're designing for um, you know, profits or social, um, some sort of social change or you're trying to persuade someone of their opinion, that's actually the outcome you're going for. And the product is just a route to that. So this, um, this auditorium here is quite beautifully designed, but it's not because it just looks nice. It's because it, it lets us gather here and exchange ideas. So the point of all of this, why I'm harping on this point, is that process is a lot harder to articulate. It's a lot harder to point to than a physical product. Um, but I think it's, it's just as important, probably more important. And today I want to talk about a specific kind of process, which I'm going to call data design. Um, it's a special kind of design process I'm going to define here as any design process heavily informed by data such that the output of the designed product changes significantly when the data informing the process change. Um, note the plural use of data, very nice, classy. Um, so this, this could really be a lot of things. This could be about information architecture, web design, um, designing a statistics database. This could refer to a lot of different things. Um, today, I'm going to talk specifically about data visualization, which I see as sort of a sub-specialty of data design. And these are visual solutions to data-driven problems. Um, we, I think it's very easy, just in our common language, we talk about data visualization as you know, visual representations of data and maps. But I think it's important to come back to this, this um, 
kind of core definition that with design we're trying to solve a specific problem and it's important to remember what, what problem we're trying to address. So if we want to be better data visualizers, better designers, the good news is there are a lot of people out there, um, many of them are in this room, who are doing amazing work. So we can look to these people for examples. Um, some of the small boutique kind of data design firms out there, uh, Accurate in Milan and New York, Halftone in uh, San Francisco Bay Area, Fathom in Boston, uh, the Office for Creative Research is in New York, uh, Periscopic in Portland, Oregon, and Stamen in San Francisco. I know this is a very like US focused list. These are the people I'm sort of most familiar with. Um, and they're doing amazing work. I think all of their work has sort of influenced the work that we do. But what's really exciting to me is it's, it used to just be kind of a couple of these small, teeny individual firms who are focusing on this sort of newly exploding field of visualization. But now we actually see a lot of really fantastic work coming out of other areas, not just from these specialists. Uh, so in one, of course, in journalism, we have tons, like huge interest in data journalism. A lot of institutions, including people from the BBC here today, who are doing amazing work. Um, some of my favorites are coming from Bloomberg, Visual Data, National Geographic, of course, the New York Times. We also have many, many data visualizers working as individual freelancers. So Jan Willem Tulp in the Netherlands, Jen Lowe in New York, Moritz Stefaner in Germany, uh, Nathan Yao, Santiago Ortiz in Argentina, Nathan's in, in the East Bay in California, and Stephanie Posavac, who's uh, somewhat local in London. So we have individual freelancers who also are doing really great work. And then of course in private companies we have internal research groups like Google's Big Picture Data Group in Cambridge and, um, and Mapbox is doing fantastic like mind-blowing stuff with maps right now. Um, NASA in the US does amazing like scientific visualizations. Obviously we have people from the ONS and all kinds of other uh, local government agencies here who are doing great work too. So all this is just to say there are people doing amazing work in all kinds of fields now, which I think is super exciting on one hand because this field is blowing up. We have so many people coming to data visualization. Um, I work mostly with students, so I'm looking at it from the student point of view. But you know, lots of people coming in and they're sort of saying, how do I do what they did? How do I make these amazing maps of the world? How do I make these maps of my city? How do I um, explain people how significant this data is that I'm familiar with? Um, lastly, in academia, so there's one project I worked on here, so I'm biased, but I like Kindred Britain, which is here in the middle. Um, we also have Selfie City, which is a collaboration between a lot of people. It's a really fun project, and uh, Poem Viewer. I think in academia, in that context, there's this movement toward the digital humanities, where we have people coming from a traditional academic background, kind of discovering the power of computation and expressing the data that they're already comfortable working with. Um, so there's a, a lot of opportunities here as well. So what's our, what's our original, like our starting point, our problem that we're trying to get at? Well, I think the, the easiest way to say this is kind of how do they do it? That's what everyone wants to know. Like, I want to do cool stuff like that. I want to, um, you know, make something that's so, like, engaging that it takes down the server. How do I make that happen? I think we could re reframe this question a little more formally by saying what data design process results in the most successful outcomes? Um, the answer to this question is really important for students, anybody new to the field, because kind of from the outside, it looks, uh, the process looks roughly like this, right? Like even when you're just talking to people at a cocktail party or something, they get, well, somehow there's like a spreadsheet on one end and then there's this like amazing, infinitely zoomable map, crazy, awesome thing that tells me about our government on the other side. Um, so there's some sort of starting point and there's some ending point, but the in-between is really messy. And this has been illustrated really clearly by Tim Brennan. Um, this is an adaptation of his original illustration and I love this because you start at some unknown place and some unknown time with this giant question mark. You wiggle through in some indeterminate way and you end up, uh, sorry, this is the wrong slide. Here we go, okay. <laughs> um, you end up with you know, money, success, power, whatever your goal is, however that's defined. 
So coming back to this original question, so what design process results in the most successful outcomes? Rather than making you wait until the end of this presentation for the answer, um, this life-changing answer, I want to just going to drop it on you now, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. So it sort of depends. So of course it depends, but like, this is the most honest answer that I can give. And my students, I think, get really annoyed um, when I give them this kind of answer to lots of things, because it always depends. It depends on something. So on what does it depend? Um, these are some of the factors. Obviously, the size of your team, expertise available, um, this is the data available, what are your goals, what's your medium. Um, but none of these things kind of on their own, um, you can't just tweak these individual axes. So if you don't have enough people, you have like a team of one, you can't add three more people and necessarily get a great successful output. Um, if you don't have enough money, you can't necessarily just throw more money at the problem and get a great design. Like we know that's not how design works because we've all worked on different committees and subcommittees and committees of committees and that sort of design by committee doesn't work. That's not a good process. So I think um, a good starting point, because uh, there's no actual like simple answer to this question, but one way we can start is by looking at people who are really good at this and have done this a bunch of times and they've tried to map their process. So I just sort of quickly survey uh, those contributions. Some of these you may have seen. So this is from Ben Fye's book, Visualizing Data, and I love, love this diagram. He's broken this out into sort of seven stages of the process. So acquire, parse, filter, mine, represent, refine, interact. And you notice mostly you travel from left to right. Mostly you're making progress toward the right. But at certain key points, um, he indicates you're likely to have to jump back. So once you get to the representation stage, when you're actually finally addressing the visuals, you may realize you need to loop back and filter your data to just get the pieces you're really interested in. Mort Stefaner has this diagram, which I really love. So the two middle stages here, explore and sketch, define and produce, sort of roughly correspond to Ben Fry's entire uh, workflow. But Stefaner has added here in the beginning kind of this first stage of clarify what and why. Like, what are we doing? What are the questions we're asking? Why are we even here? Uh, there's the philosophy for you. And at the very end, you have maintain and analyze. And this is a very sort of web-specific approach, but I think it's really important too because um, going back to this idea of design being misunderstood as a product, uh, we tend to think of a design like, oh, I've made this design and I put it out in the world and it's done. Um, but really there should be this sort of feedback loop like we were just hearing from Alan in his talk where they're collecting data and sort of monitoring, well, how is this thing actually being used? And are there ways we could adjust it to improve it? Uh, Nathan Yao in his book, Visualize This, has this sort of like decision type flow chart um, that basically you loop around and eventually you get stuck in this infinite loop of, um, does what you're doing make sense? Uh, no, do it again. Does it make sense now? No, do it again. Does it make sense now? Uh, Jeff Hare, who uh, was at Stanford until recently, is at the University of Washington now. Um, I mean, you probably all recognize him na his name. Uh, he, besides D3, was involved in a lot of the sort of building a lot of the frameworks that led up sort of predecessors to D3, like Protoviz and Flare. He has this uh, also seven step diagram, which I think is really interesting, sort of parallels Ben Fry's more arrows looping back and forth, right? So it's starting to get messier. But I like this last stage of dissemination. So he's making the point that, again, the design process, you don't just end up with a chart. You have to actually get that chart out there in the world for it to have some sort of impact. And then specific to data journalism, Mark McCormick, a graphic designer, worked with Simon Rogers, who of course used to be at The Guardian, is now at Twitter, um, to produce this really tall graphic. So I've broken it up into two parts. So we start on the left and sort of drop down and then it loops onto the right. Um, this is a little bit more detailed. I think it's really interesting because he has sort of starts with sharing data, um, not necessarily sort of in the publishing sense, but sort of sharing data within the team, like pulling this data in, trying to figure out what it means, gets funneled into spreadsheets, and then we sort of have this filtering, merging, parsing process. Um, 
recalculate, run a sanity check. And then in this diagram, he has multiple possible outputs. So the way that he's looking at it, one, or the way that they're looking at it, one possible output is to the graphics team who makes like a custom visualization. But um, they're also really open to using all kinds of other, you know, free and in-house tools that you can just feed things to and quickly, quickly generate something. So I think these are some really, they're great process maps. It's really interesting to see kind of what, what they share in common and what's, what's different about them. But I think it, they're not, um, we need to go deeper to explore like a proper answer to this question. And I'll, I'll tell you why. I'm gonna pick on Ben Fries here because I love his book and I love this, uh, this graphic and I think it's kind of the best, best known of all of these. The problem is, even if you have this list of seven stages, it's unclear exactly what is involved in each stage. So let's start at the first stage, the ac acquire stage. Um, that probably means I'm gathering something, I'm getting the data, but it doesn't, you know, knowing that I should be acquiring doesn't tell me how to acquire, where to acquire from, um, what if I'm unable to acquire the data, what if I can't find it, what if it doesn't exist, uh, what if it might exist but I'm not allowed to get to it, what if I did get to it, uh, but the sources may be untrustworthy. So there are like a ton of questions that are all wrapped up into this one, this one stage. And kind of one thing I'm gonna propose today is I think a useful way of thinking about this is that within each of these stages, uh, kind of no matter where you are in your process, you're having to ask questions and make decisions all along the way. Um, we can imagine if you started your process over on the left-hand side, this diagram, and each one of these dots represents a decision, um, kind of every good decision pushes you a little bit closer toward a probability of success, and every poor decision pushes you kind of closer toward failure. And of course, this is however you define that for any project. So success could be fame and riches or you know, an engaged audience. Um, if you do get fame and riches through visualization, let me know. Um, <laughs> Failure could be nobody noticed or, you know, we got zero hits or we actually lost readership or wh whatever it is. So I think um, what's interesting about this is to, in order to complete, well, in, in order to sort of um, make it all the way over to success, you have to make lots and lots of decisions. So taking that example of acquisition as, uh, as an example, you need to know sort of what's the context in which you're operating. You have to know how to make those decisions, uh, but you also have to have sort of this larger awareness of what decisions even have to be made. Um, so that's kind of the first thing is, what, do, what choices do I have available to me? What do I need to be thinking about? And once I know what I'm thinking about, how do, like, I should think about it properly. So of course, this, this sort of visualizing, you know, fake decision-making processes, there are a lot of different ways this could go. Um, but here I've highlighted one of the paths in blue, and hopefully, hopefully you can see that. So you could imagine if you made sort of poor decisions over the course of a project, you'd end up kind of on the failure end of the axis. Uh, you could also end up somewhere in the middle, or if you make great decisions almost all the way through, you end up with a successful project. Now what, what are these decisions about? Well, I think these could be, you know, some decisions are small, some are really large, so some are just, you know, where do I save this file? What kind of tool should I use? Uh, what medium should I publish to? Um, who, and then there's, you know, I guess more philosophical questions like who am I doing this work for? Why am I engaged in this process? Am I just doing this because it's my job? Am I doing this because it's, it's really seems important for the world to know this information? So all day, every day, like we're making hundreds and thousands of little decisions and I think we can, imagine that they all add up to something really great or in the middle or are not so great. Now if we take this kind of visual metaphor and we apply this to uh, the different processes we saw in these process maps, uh, here's three stages from Ward Stefaner's process map. We can imagine we start out kind of with 50-50 chance of doing okay. We make some great decisions, we move up, we sort of waver a little bit, and then by the third stage we've gone up, we're pretty close to success. So you could imagine sort of modeling your process uh, sorry, modeling your decision-making process throughout this map. Um, here this is with uh, Ben Fry's seven stages, and again, you can imagine you're sort of hopefully slowly working your way up. Now, 
you remember from the process maps that we saw a lot of like looping back arrows. And this is, uh, of course, somewhat artificial because in reality, I mean, in one sense, we are always kind of moving forward. But in terms of the stages, like the activities we're engaging in, uh, we often have to sort of loop back. So this is, I think, where we get to this um, needing this kind of awareness during the process that you're engaged in the process, right? Because you need to know when is it time to step back? When is it time to loop back to an earlier stage? When is it time to sort of jump ahead to a, um, sort of a, a future stage? And th to me, these are the, the two like really critical kinds of decisions. It's like how to execute the task at hand, how to choose the best colors, how to align the typography, how to um, you know, activate your API, whether, whatever like very practical type question. Those are one kind of decisions. And then the other kinds of decisions are these sort of meta process decisions that require some sort of awareness. So how do we kind of, what do we need to make, make these decisions properly? Well, I think we need expertise. And this might just seem like a totally obvious statement, but expertise is this informed capacity to make decisions. So obviously there's some value in, in expertise. You want, if you're doing visualization, you want to be a data viz expert. But what does kind of expertise mean? What does that actually uh, encompass? And what expertise exactly do we need? Like this is the question that people coming into the field ask all the time. Like, you know, what's the one book that I, sh I should start with? Or what's the one, you know, where should I start? Basically, they just want this one starting point and from there they can branch out into anything. So again, I hate making you wait for answers. Um, you can probably guess this one by now though. Uh, it does depend. Yeah, it depends on it depends on another number of things, um, and this is why it's like there's no one answer that that fits everybody. And this is why when people ask, kind of, well, where should I start? What book should I start? I always ask about them. Like, well, what's your what's your background? What makes sense to you already? What are you good at? What are you you know scared of? Um, I think that's that's sort of the starting place. But here's here's my proposal um, to this. It it depends uh, non answer. So here's what I think is the, the expertise we need for data design. In the middle, we're gonna have some, some core skills. These are the things that are absolutely essential everybody needs. Um, second ring out, we have things that are gonna be extremely helpful. And third ring out, we have things that are maybe sort of just, just a bonus. I'm gonna step through these and sort of explain myself. And uh, I hope this can trigger a conversation so you can tell me how I'm wrong or how I missed something or how I got it right on the first try. That would be really exciting. So first, we're doing visualization. You need visual design skills, absolutely, right? You have to be able to work with color, typography, composition. You have to be able to arrange the data in a visual way. So I think that's, that's obvious and nobody would argue with that. Secondly, you have to have basic data fluency. You have to at least be able to understand how to work with, you know, I don't care if it's in a spreadsheet or a, a text file, but you have to understand qualitative and quantitative values um, you have to be able to perform some, not even stati full statistical analysis, but just like some basic understanding of wh what's a number, what's a value, what does this represent. Third, you're going to need domain expertise um, as it applies to your project. So depending on the project, if you do a, if you do a, um, you know, a map of hydrological data, you're going to have to understand where that data came from and what it actually represents. If you're working on something about the financial markets, you have to understand where those measurements came from and what they represent. And the fourth thing, which is I think we don't talk about enough, is you have to have curiosity. I think um, this isn't just a nice to have. Uh, if you're going to do a successful visualization, you have to be a, just a curious person. You have to ask all like questions all the time about why are we doing this? What does this mean? Um, how could we do this better? The curious people, like these are the people at, um, you know, who are the, the data journalists who are like constantly asking questions about the world and asking questions about their data, asking questions about their colleagues, just like probing, probing, probing. That's how you get to like a comprehensive answer. So this is what I think is essential right now. And again, you can convince me that I've missed something. Um, then in the second ring, you notice we have like a bunch of more sort of skills based things. We have coding, writing, understanding of logic, statistics, scientific method, visual perception, cognitive science, computer science. So I'm not going to read this whole list, but these are sort of all the skills that hopefully a bunch of us have a lot of these skills. Um, probably nobody has all of these skills. This is where this, um, 
this diagram might be useful in hiring people, because so that's another question that comes up is, well, we want to do visualization uh, and we need to like hire people, but we don't know who to hire. We don't know how to find these people. And um, you know, we don't know who this magic person is that knows how to do everything all in one person. Well, there's, there aren't, I mean, there's maybe one or two or three people who do all these things, <laughs> um, but most people can't do all of these things or can't do all of them well. Uh, which is fine. You don't, uh, not everybody has to be able to do everything, but you may want all of these skills kind of on your team. Uh, and finally, kind of this third ring, I have sort of some more, um, I think of like history, art history, business management, architecture, mathematics, cartography. Um, there's probably some cartographers in the room who are going to be upset I've relegated that out to the, the third ring. But the reason I'm doing that here is, I mean, this is, this is like the context in which you operate and the context in which you understand the world and the context in which you're making these day-to-day -day decisions about, about your process and your work. So it's not that cartography isn't important, right? It's that you're gonna be coming to this work as a cartographer. Um, somebody else could be coming to this work as um, like a, I don't know, some, somebody who's like studied business and management. So maybe they're working in this design firm, but they're working on the business <coughs> side. And that's, um, that's actually part of the process that we can't ignore. Um, Eric Roddenbeck of Stamen Design gave this fantastic talk at I.O. this last year. And every time I've seen him talk, he's talked about his work and talked about the watercolor maps and the financial market maps and um, the, the San Francisco tech bus maps and how they, how they produce all this visual work, which is fascinating. But this talk was completely about how scary and difficult it is to run a design firm and how scary it is to be in charge of covering everybody's paycheck every month. Um, in a time when you know, San Francisco rents are going through the roof and it's just not an affordable place to be. So I think this kind of understanding business and management, this is an essential part of the process and that's gonna inform your context too. If, if you're the boss, um, you can't pretend that you're not the boss while you're managing your team. Now there's one thing missing here, obviously. Like I said, not one person can have all of these skills. So another way we can sort of imagine this is we have two different people working together and these lovely white arrows indicate really good communication being facilitated <coughs> between these people. Um, so if you're building a team, you can try and get all of these skills, but um, you're not going to get all of them in one person. So let's say this is me on the left. Let's say I'm okay at visual design. I have some data fluency. I'm curious um, and I'm a freelancer and uh, a client on the right hires me and this client doesn't have any visual design skills. Uh, but they have the data and they have the domain expertise. So they can tell me, they can teach me about the financial markets, they can teach me about these measurements, and I can bring that in. And we can work together, but we can only work together if we're communicating really well. Um, you know, we can communicate poorly and the process can take a lot longer, or we can do a poor, a bad job. It's sort of like that, was it cheap, cheap, fast, easy? What's the triangle? And you get to choose, you know, choose two. Um, for everything to run smoothly, we need to be able to communicate. And we can picture this again back in our sort of decision tree. Um, we essentially want smaller loops. We don't want these big, long loops that take you know, months and months of sending data back and forth, sending designs back and forth. Oh, can you review this? It's like, no, let's, let's work faster and make these decisions more quickly together and leverage each other's expertise. So one answer to sort of this problem is really what you need on your team is more people with more skills, working more closely together, making more of the right decisions more often. It's sort of a probability game. It's kind of, if you can get more of those things, you're more likely to end up on the, the top right of that chart. Um, so in the end, my, my sort of real answer to this original question is um, we need three things. We need these process maps for kind of the big picture guidance. Uh, we need more, experti more expertise for better decision making and of course better communication within whoever our teams are or with clients uh, for faster iteration. So all of this brings me to asking a favor of you. I want to know about your process. I think um, these are sort of my initial best guesses at what the most important elements are. Um, but all of you practice, well, most of you, maybe some of you practice data visualization, you're interested in data visualization, or you wouldn't be sitting here. So I wanna know kind of what works for you, what doesn't work for you, 
Um, and what sort of what are your what are your stories? So back in April, I I wanted th these questions kept coming up so much. I wanted to research them and I wanted to come up with some kind of answers. Uh, like I said, I don't have any definitive answers yet, but I put together this survey. The point of this survey was just to ask enough questions to understand what questions I should be asking. Um, that's really all I was trying to get out of this. And these are some of the questions that I asked. I just sent this out on Twitter. Uh, a couple of the ones I thought were really interesting. Uh, you know, what, what's the title on your business card? Because number one, we don't have like proper language yet. Um, nobody knows kind of in the public, it's like, oh, I'm a data visualizer, or I'm a digital map maker, or I'm a, you know, people use all kinds of words to describe what they do. Um, and then less formally, when you're at a dinner party, how do you explain to other people what you do? Uh, of course, I ask people, please describe your data visualization process. Uh, for whom do you produce work? Who's the ultimate audience? Are you doing stuff for public consumption, or is this internal to your company or your firm? Um, and how often do you feel your visualizations are successful? I kind of want to get, you know, zero to 100 percent. There's like tons of people practicing this now, but how many times, like, out of 100 projects, how many of those are successful, or how many of those do we think are successful based on whatever um, those criteria are? And finally, what other questions should I have asked? So I had some interesting responses. Um, first, people define success really differently, and I think this is interesting to look at. So this first person here, the client is happy, um, so the freelancer, obviously, the design is clean, the code doesn't suck. The visualization shows something interesting or allows people to find interesting things in it. Uh, another person, I delivered it on time. Actual usage by readers of the story, not just casual, oh, nice map. Um, and reusable code or components. I think this is interesting because this is a project where uh, the success is not just being judged by the outward facing, like the product of the design. Like part of the product of that process is also Great, I, I actually built some additional tools that can make the job easier for me next time. And then this, this final answer is like such a designer answer. There is nothing more to improve given the constraints. I love this answer because this means it might not have been great, but it was as best as it possibly could have been given how little time I had or what, uh, what I had available to me. Uh, the next thing, uh, people start their process really differently and th these are some sort of excerpts from the beginnings of how people describe their own, their own process. I'll let you read all the, I mean, develop a hypothesis, ca collect raw data, uh, create folders, um, then whenever I have time for an idea, I dig into the folder. Uh, so this is somebody who's not doing it for work, obviously just for fun. Um, and then have questions to answer with the data. Start with a, start with a question. Um, and in all caps, I think this last one was from Andy Kirk. Uh, all capital letters, establish the visualization's purpose. So I, I love this because people, you know, start at really different points. Um, and one, two, and three here are some of the possible, uh, I guess, common starting points. So a lot of people start at step number three. Like what, what data do we have? Um, this is especially like, this isn't a bad starting point. Uh, it's really common for students and students in my class. Um, Oftentimes, like our earlier projects, I'll provide them with a data set. I'll say, great, your project is you're working with this data set that I've already collected for you. Um, and that's okay, I think that's fine, uh, you know, as an exercise. Um, but it doesn't give you quite as much focus as starting at number one or number two. So what problem am I actually trying to solve? What specific questions am I trying to answer? And it's really interesting to see in people's responses how how they start in those different places. And then depending on where you start and what the answers to those questions are, uh, step four is sort of optional. Um, a lot of times you'll get to step four and realize, well, I need, I need more data, I need different data to solve this problem or answer this question. So something I wanna share with you today is that I've collected all this research. I'm not sure where this research is gonna go kind of long term, um, but I'm putting this all online. It's already online, so this is on GitHub. And I want to encourage everybody here who practices Viz uh, to take the survey. There's a link to the survey on there. Uh, read the survey responses. I have the raw CSV file up there. Um, and I have a, a huge PDF with like tons and tons of reading. So everything I've been able to collect, uh, this is books, blog posts, um, specific process blogs, anything that's talking about design process and especially visualization process. If you know of anything else, 
please send it to me and I want to add it to this list. I want this to be like kind of an ongoing resource for people. Um, a couple months after Steve Jobs passed away, Hugh Deberly is this fantastic information designer based in San Francisco. He's an alumnus of Netscape and, uh, and Apple. He wrote this beautiful piece on the company blog called what, is, what Can Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive Teach Us About Designing? He came away with kind of three core points. So first, whole systems thinking, uh, the importance of that. Number two, the importance of deep and broad teams. And third, kind of this concept of design as conversations. I think this is a really interesting way of framing design. Uh, he says, you know, only one form of conversation leads to a partnership, to deep trust, and ultimately to innovation and sustained period good design. Such conversations are principally about goals, about beliefs, about values, and about quality. And I, I love this because this, to me, is what is so exciting about like open source and the internet and um, events like this really special conference. Like this is why we're here is not really just to sit here and like watch me stand up on the stage and talk, but we're here so that we can be in the same room together. We can start having these conversations or continue these conversations from last time. Uh, so I really hope that you will, you know, start documenting your own process, write your own process posts, uh, share that with everybody here, or at least share that with me. And um, let's continue this conversation so we can all get better together. Thank you very much. Feel free to leave, but if anybody wants to geek out on process more, I'm happy to take questions and, and talk. Yeah, thank you, Scott, very much. Uh, we have uh, plenty of time for questions, and I'll go around and share the mic. Scott, as a result of your uh, recent experiment with gathering data from designers about how they do it, you now have a lot of text data. And um, one of the problems I've found sort of interesting over the years is how to visualize lots of text data. Do you have ideas on that? <laughs> Visualizing text data is the worst. Well, because there's so many, I mean, they're really like, um, you know, I mean, there's there's word clouds and like kind of these cutesy things which may have value in certain contexts, but um, I'm not sure for something like this, like this is why I have this whole reading list is I'm not sure, um, again, because design is, I'm thinking about it not as like a thing I can point to, oh, okay, I just have to make the thing black and square and then it's a success. Like it's easy to talk about the products, um, it's easy to visualize that. But when we're talking about process, um, I'm not sure, and actually that's, I, I'm not sure it lends itself to that kind of easy reduction. Uh, and also that, that's actually kind of a bigger question that I have for the community or for, I don't know, academia. I know there are people out there sort of studying process, um, certainly in kind of like business and management, right? There's this whole focus on process and there's like, oh, Six Sigma process and how do you optimize your process? So there are people that geek out on process even more than I do, like at this whole other level, right? Um, but that's just not my area. So I, something I'm looking for is, I'm not sure visualization is the solution to answering these kinds of questions, but I think reading and sort of like understanding the nuances, it, that's part of the answer. But another part of the answer might be um, learning about these fields about which I, I know nothing at this point. Because um, I know other people have systems in place for thinking about, thinking about, you know, these sort of meta questions. The question over here, and over here. Don't let Robert talk, though. <laughs> Last time that happened, it wasn't good. Just in my presentation, your, your speaking was fine. It was great. <laughs> um, you were looking at the various different ways to start the design process, and, and you know the best way is what problem am I trying to solve? Uh, the next best is what data do I have? Um, you didn't mention the way I start my design process, which is, oh, there's a really cool visualization technique over here on the D3 gallery or, or wherever. How can I squeeze that into, right. how, or how can I use that? Yeah. How can I produce a visualization like that? So it's, it's kind of more, 
technique driven or more example driven. It's, it's like a solution looking for a problem, but does that have a space in any design space that you can think of? Does, does it have, like does that approach have value? Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, it's kind of, you know, I want to be like that. that right. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, thank you for sharing that, first of all, because that, that's definitely like, especially with D3, um, something that is really fantastic is there's like tons and tons of examples available now. Um, something that I think is also a problem is that there are tons and tons of examples now, and it's almost too easy to just sort of copy and paste. And um, I'm on the D3 Google group, and there's like 10 questions like this every day where people are like, oh, I'm looking for an example that just says this and this and this and this, and these 10 really specific things that I want. Can somebody, this just yesterday, got one of these emails. It's like, can somebody just make an example that does that and then post it up? It's like, oh, so you, you want, I'm just gonna do all the work for you, and then you just copy, you know, you put your name on it, and like you're done with your projects, you know, good job. Um, and what, what I don't like about that is just that the, per, the original questioner isn't like learning how to do it themselves. So next time they're gonna come back to the list with the same, same kind of question. Um, so the value I think that I see in that is starting with another example is like as a learning process. Uh, like I was saying in my class, like for some of our projects, uh, my students will have to go find their own data set, but for the earlier projects, I'll provide a data set. And I think this is pretty common in, in other courses too. It's like, okay, here's what your starting point um, just to make things a little more palatable, because you don't want to scare them off yet. Um, now go create something. So everybody's starting from the same place, uh, and I think there's there's huge value just in like learning how to use the tool. Where I think it gets problematic is people sort of you know claiming that work is their own or just sort of doing the copy paste job without gaining any kind of understanding from it. Which which to me I don't really understand that mindset because I'm excited about you know well how does it work and yeah. Yeah, you got that I like to process in that? Okay, yeah, okay, cool, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> Okay, Robert. Any, okay. <laughs> I just got, I got the mic. Um, so I, I just, so for context, for, for people who weren't at the Paris Coffee event in Portland, I, I just had some disagreements with what Mike, what, what Scott was saying. Uh, there, so I'm, I was I'm not disagreeing this time. I'm just gonna. <laughs> I will. I will again try to to further your knowledge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna step out for a sec. Is that okay? Yeah. No. Go ahead. No, that's. So you talked about you showed these examples of workflows that are very much inspired by this this pipeline model that's very mm -hmm. common in computer science. You do A and then B and then C and the data flows through. And that's, I think, what, what many of these are based on. And then they just added a couple more arrows to make them a bit more, more realistic because mm -hmm. nobody actually works that way, and other than you know computers. But um, there's a very interesting model that I saw uh, that in, in Mike Bostock's talks, and I think this one was at OpenVis, if I'm not mistaken. What he does is he has this this kind of outline, which is kind of a funnel shape. Where at the beginning it's very wide. And then it gets narrower and narrower and narrower, and then there's and then he's talking about the journalism context. So there's a deadline, and at, at the deadline, it, it's got to be, uh, you know, at a point, uh, mm -hmm. no matter what. Mm -hmm. And then the the way he actually draws the actual design is he's got a line uh, like a path that kind of winds up and down, and mm -hmm. time is going you know this way towards the the pointy end of the funnel. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about that is that I like the, that model because it shows you that or that it kind of communicates the idea that. In the beginning, you can experiment a lot. You can try lots of very different things, and you mm -hmm. want to be able to do that. But as you get closer to your deadline or to the end of your process, you have to be more conservative, and you have to be figure out, okay, which of those crazy mm -hmm. ideas are maybe a good idea, and which of those are just too crazy? And mm -hmm. then kind of actually start to converge on the actual final one. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you've seen those, and if you have any thoughts on those, and how those might, be, might work with the, 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 the pipeline type. Yeah, that, um, I think I've heard, some, I, ha I haven't seen that. I think I've heard somebody else mention that before. I think that um, that's really great. So it's, it's sort of like the opposite shape of what I'm drawing here, right? It's like, <laughs> instead of branching out, it's going in. And like what I'm trying to illustrate here is there are a lot of possible endpoints, right? Like there are always, all these different places a project could end up. But I think what you're saying is there's not it's not contrary to this, but like um, 
as you're flowing through those stages, your sort of possibility space is larger at the beginning. And of course, by the time you actually publish it or turn it in or whatever, then it's, it's narrowed down to one. So yeah, and I'm, I think that would be a great supplement to this. If we could figure out how to visualize, like, well, m again, maybe visualization is not the answer in this case. That's always like, oh yeah, we should just visualize it. Um, if we could figure out how to, yeah, I don't know, connect that with this and some of these other process maps, that would be, that would be super interesting. Because you're totally right, because a lot of these look like extremely linear and it's not at all. Because it does feel like, oh, when I'm parsing, there's just one thing I should be doing. It's, I shouldn't be sort of flailing around. But really, that's when you should be flailing the most, right? Yeah, that's great, thanks. There's one question in the back too, I think. Uh, thanks, it's uh, Andy from Tableau. Um, just if you go back to the process map, just one question or comment on this is, uh, you, I think a weakness yes. with this, and I wondered your comment on it, is that you suggest by, if that's the way things go, you make one bad decision and you cannot succeed. Or you're, make, or you're doing brilliantly until the last minute and you cannot do failure. You know, you could either way. So the, the challenge I have with that is that you can, still, you can start off terribly and still pull it out of the bag. Which is the optimistic view of what you just said. You could also do wonderfully and then lose it at the last second. But neither of which is represented. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's great. Some, there was some, the question in the back. Some editorial decisions were made for visual clarity. <laughs> so it wasn't completely, but yes, absolutely. Oh, there you go. I think that would be too scary to tell that to students. You know, you could be doing a great job up until the last minute. <laughs> and there's so many ways you could just screw it up right now. <laughs> just, just letting you know, yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. Hi, Scott. Um, I guess one interesting thing is if you extrapolate that even further, you could have kind of, I guess James Dyson or someone like that might look at it that I don't know how many times he his products failed for whatever reason. But if you extrapolated that ten times on, you might have a number of failures and then actually finally sort of get a product that you think, yeah, you know, that's that's a world beater or whatever. So it's. I guess it's showing that process is, is so long that, you know, that kind of failure mm -hmm. is part of a good design process, if you like. Yeah, and you, you could have, um, I totally agree. I mean, you know, on the more software development side, there's like Agile and these other development processes, right? And I mean, to me, this is, uh, I don't think this is like the, you know, most perfect visual metaphor, but to me, it's helpful to sort of visualize like, okay, I'm, I'm trying to work up and get into the top right corner. Um, but absolutely, like if you have something that has multiple releases or like you've designed a, a map, but then you have multiple versions of the map, maybe you could sort of think about, oh, well, the first version didn't do so well, but then on subsequent releases, we, we made improvements. Yeah. Hi, you, you began by saying that everything here is, just about everything here is designed. But of course, the one most significant component that's in this room is ourselves, and we weren't designed. And the interesting thing about ourselves... This is the philosophy. Well, the, the interesting thing about ourselves is that, is that we're actually somewhat uncomfortable with that, and so we cover ourselves in things that are designed. Yeah. And I'm just wondering whether actually people's process, it's a human thing. We, we have our own way of doing our work. We dress it up in something and call it a process, but it's actually just a thing that comes from us as humans. Humans yeah. have always been making things. It's yeah. part of what it is to be human. And we have intuitive processes for doing that. Some are rubbish, some are better. So, so first, are you just asking where I got my shirt? That's what you're getting at? <laughs> it's a lovely shirt. I, I suppose, I suppose, I suppose. I'm, I'm just worried that, that this, this descends. Yeah. So I'm, I come from a software background. Software engineering has been doing this nasal, na navel gazing of, yeah. you know, what is the best process for doing what we do forever, and it never arrives at an answer. Yeah, because software just, is the worst. I yeah. would caution against it. I just think it, it doesn't matter. No, 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 no. Yeah, in, in all seriousness, no. I appreciate your comment. Yeah, and I. Um, 
I totally agree. I mean, I, if I understand, if I could rephrase what I think part of your comment is, is um, this is all just an attempt to sort of feel like we have some sort of control over reality and in reality we're all just these biological beings bouncing around and we're gonna do what we do and hopefully we try our best. But it's, it's actually, reality is so much messier than any diagram, right, or any map. I think what I've learned over my career is that the more I know about what came before, the better I'm able to do. So I'm sure mm -hmm. lots of designers do that. They study old books, they look at old designs, they're interested in architecture and whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think that has helped me better than reading books where people have proposed some great new way mm -hmm. of doing work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's all I can offer. I mean, I think that's, yeah, that's how you get expertise, partly, is the, the practice, but also like the study, for sure. Yeah, that's great.